Hello, we've got another uh, Chemistry 111 exam coming up and many of you asked for more of these uh, review problem set YouTube answer keys and so I'm happy to provide a couple more before the exam on Wednesday and get you into fall break. So let's go ahead and jump right in. This first problem says, okay, you've got a, a task ahead of you. The instructor wants you to make a 0 0.250 molar solution of sodium chloride and gives you the salt container that is, you know, the bottle or whatever the salt comes from and a 200 mil volumetric flask. So pretty easy, okay? We talked about this in class, but let's go ahead and dive right in. We've got, well, let me turn the pin back on. Um, you know, you're given a, a volumetric flask, right? Um, you know, it looks kind of like that with the long neck. A terrible drawing, I apologize. And you have your mark. Um, so this will say we've got, what, 200.00 milliliter. And you want this uh, 200, 2.25 uh, molar, and so I, you know, for this one I like to kind of use what I'm given. And here we want to go from molarity, right? So we have 0 0.250, and I again always like to write this out. This is moles of solute, right? And so in this case, this is going to be your sodium chloride, and that's all over liters of solution. And if we want to uh, think about our units here, right? Um, we're going to want to cancel this mole so we can say, okay, well, for every one mole of good old sodium chloride, uh, you can look this on, up on the periodic table. I think I get something like 58 point, um, what did I get, 443, right, 443, and that's going to be grams of sodium chloride. And one thing you want to be careful to do is, um, you know, uh, it sounds kind of silly, but I really want you to kind of get into the mode of, of labeling everything here. Um, so if you're not doing that, that's going to really cause you some problems. So go ahead and label it as grams of what, even in the problem solving, because that will really help you out. So this will allow us to cancel out the moles of sodium chloride. We've got the grams we want up here, but we've got to cancel the liters. And so here you can see that we're only going to make 200 mils. So if you you can do the uh, you know the conversion, but you can probably do it in your head, and you can say 200 is a fifth of a a liter, so that's 0 0.200 liters, right? Liters of solution. You therefore can cancel out your liters and you're left with what you need. So this is a really good illustration how even if you're not sure, think about your units because they can often guide you if you're not uh, certain about a problem. And if you punch the buttons on your calculator, I think I get something like 2.92 grams of sodium chloride. And then the question asks you, okay, um, how would you complete the task? Well, you know, you go to the balance and you weigh out the 2.9 grams. Uh, you would, a um, couple different ways you could do it, right? You could dissolve it in a, a beaker and, and pour it into the, the flask, or if you wanted to, you could be very careful and transfer the solid into the, the volumetric and then maybe, oh, I don't know, um, put a little bit of uh, DI water in there, swirl it around, make sure you get everything dissolved put some more DI water in there, um, swirl it around again, and then finally, you know, you're going to be very careful to try to fill it up um, close to the mark, but obviously you're going to want to be very careful not to uh, get too close to the mark and use your dropper to get, remember the meniscus needs to be uh, touching the, the bottom of the meniscus, meniscus touches the bottom of that mark, and put the cap on, invert a number of times, just like we've done in lab, um, there you go, invert, and mix it all up, and you've got a nice solution that's 0.250 molar sodium chloride. I mean, this is how you do it in a lab. Oftentimes, you know, solutions aren't made for you and you gotta make them yourself. So that's part of chemistry, right? All right, the second one's a good question because it ties in a lot of the valence bond stuff that we were talking about, right? So here we can say, for atom number one, what is the hybridization? So atom number one is this carbon, right, right here. And you see we have uh, one, two electron density groups around this. So in order to get the uh, hybridization we need for two um, things that are two bonding groups, we would say that's going to be sp. Uh, for atom number two, we see four here, one, two, three, four, and that's going to be simply sp3. For atom number three, we see one, two, three, so that gives us sp2. Pretty easy. Now it's looking for the ideal bond angle. Um, for bond X, or for angle X, that bond distance or bond angle is easily 180, right? Because they're uh, it's basically linear. For Y here, well, we've got one, two, three things, so that's going to be 120 ideally. And then for Z, this is based on a 
a tetrahedron, so it's going to be basically 109.5. Uh, and we could talk about the deviation for the double bond, but the question doesn't ask that, so we'll go ahead and move on. But you know, you might say that this bond angle might be a little bit larger than 120, but that's that's something we can talk about later. And then finally, this last question I think is pretty good. We're looking at this bond here, this triple bond. Remember the first bond you make is always gonna be a sigma bond. And then here we've got two pi bonds made by the overlap of the p orbitals, uh, both in maybe the plane of the paper and uh, front and behind the paper, and there you go. So the triple bond, one sigma and two pi, really simple. This last one just wants to look at some sketching of the orbitals that we've talked about before. So remember a sigma bond is along uh, the bond, along the, the internuclear axis right between the two nuclei, and so we want to look at an S orbital. So let's go ahead and draw an S as best we can, the sphere shaped right, shape right there. And then a P orbital you probably remember is the little dumbbell shape, and we can you know, phase that. And then right here where they overlap, that would be a sigma bond. And then we want two p orbitals. Well, remember pi bonds are differ because different than sigma because sigma is along the axis. So let's pretend this was something like a hydrogen and I don't know a fluorine or something, right? And so that bond right there. Um, pi, you know, this is where we talk about the idea of a, a sigma and a pi, right? So this, the sigma is that bond would have been, you know, maybe two sp two orbitals or something like that. Um, and we're looking at the above and below overlap, and that's done by the overlap of p orbitals, right? Those p orbitals that don't get hybridized, the ones that are left over. And so if you look at those, you're going to have the overlap here and the overlap down here, and you're going to have a single pi bond made from this overlap. Remember, that's just a single bond, a single pi bond, this two area of overlap. Uh, that's really important to remember. All right, and this last one's all about uh, your Lewis structures, and we've done a, quite a bit of this, so this should be a lot of review at this point. Um, you know, on the, on the exam, I think you get a little stressed a little bit, so I would go ahead and still count the electrons. Just make sure you're, you're not going to make a mistake. So here you've got bromine with a halogen at 7. You've got 6 for each oxygen. That's going to be 3 times 6 is 18. Since it's an anion, you've got plus 1 more. And if I can do some simple arithmetic, even late at night, I don't know why that number disappeared, sorry about that. That's gonna be, what, uh, 26 electrons. So let's go ahead and connect them at least. So draw bromine in the middle here. And again, a Lewis structure does not have any 3D information, so it doesn't matter how we put these around. Um, now we've got, what, six taken away. We should have 20 left over. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sorry, my pin gets a little bit weird doing lone pairs. There we go. That looks better, and then that gets our 24, and that means we've got two left over. Boom, boom, right like that. So um, that's the Lewis structure. Uh, everybody's got an octet. I'll go ahead and put the brackets just to uh, point that out. Now, here we need to look at the formal charges. Each oxygen is single bond, so that's going to be a negative. That's going to be a negative. That's going to be a negative. And bromine is going to be what? 7 minus 2 is 5 minus 3 makes that guy a positive two. And if we add them up, one, two, three negatives, two positive, we have that residual negative on the outside, which is why I like to put the bracket, just to make sure we check our work. If you look at this then for a 3D uh, point of view, right, we're gonna have an oxygen over here. We'll have one maybe behind the paper and one um, in front of the paper with that shaded triangle, and it's kinda hard to draw that, but there we go with a lone pair up here. Um, I hate that it connects that. There we go, I'll just draw it like this. So there we go, lone pair there. And if you look at that, I'll go ahead and put a little bracket there. Um, you think of the name of this, this is gonna be a trigonal based pyramid, right? So tri trigonal pyramid, there you go. Any uh, deviations? Well, I might say this lone pair is gonna um, have a lot of repulsion, so it's gonna push down here and it's gonna open up this bond. So this bond here, would be, or the angle there would be greater than 109.5, but the angles down here are going to be contracted a little bit, so I'd say those would be um, a little bit less than 109.5, and so that's one way you can look at that. And then overall polarity, um, I'll use a different color to indicate polarity, you're going to have basically, um, you know, you're going to dr draw down like that. Those oxygens are really electronegative, so we would need to go ahead and label that as that is definitely a polar molecule. 
three auctions is probably going to uh, dominate the uh, electron sharing, so that's why we're going to draw the arrow in this direction. All right, for the selenium uh, tetrafluoride, uh, we're going to have, what is that? That's, if we count sil uh, selenium is six, it's right by sulfur. Um, and then we're going to have seven times four, which is uh, 28. And then you get something on the order of what? 34 electrons for this one. I'm going to go ahead and draw them like that. There's my selenium. We have to connect them at least with one bond. And again, be careful. Don't start just drawing double bonds because you think they're going to be there. Follow this, this methodology and you'll be pretty good. So let's go ahead and do one, two, three, four, five, six. 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 Good. If you count those up, I think I get 32, which means I've got two left over that have to go in the selenium. And there we go. Um, that's our Lewis structure. Now to draw the 3D structure, we'll put the selenium here. And I'm going to go ahead and draw my fluorines in a line like this. And then I'm going to have one that's maybe behind the paper, and then one that's in front of the paper like that. I need to include my lone pair. And that lone pair is going to go in the axial position, right? Because if you think about the five electron density regions, it's going to basically be a trigonal bipyramid. But we always put the uh, lone pair in the axial, or sorry, in the equatorial position. Excuse me, I'm getting kind of tired here tonight. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yes, yeah, so let me re restate that. We have the two fluorines in the axial position and the two fluorines in the lone pair in the equatorial position. Sorry about that. Um, for a trigonal bipyramid, you always put the lone pair in the equatorial position. And so in this case, uh, if you're going to look at the geometry, it's based on trigonal bipyramid, but you don't see that lone pair. So if you think about what's left, you're going to have what's called um, a seesaw uh, geometry. And if you think about a playground, right, the this trigonal, uh, this little planar area here would be our, our pivot, and then you could see, you know, this side going up or down, which is why people call it a seesaw. Um, in terms of our bond angles, um, this angle would be roughly 90, this angle would be roughly 90, and then this angle would be 120. Since we do have a lone pair that's going to be pushing more, I'd say these bonds are probably going to be smaller uh, than ideal, because again, the same thing above. Uh, right to the left. Um, over here when that lone pair has a lot of repulsion it's going to push and these angles here would be a little bit bigger but all of these are going to be contracted. And then for a um, um, for your dipole it's going to be the same thing. You're going to be um, experiencing a dipole in this direction because those fluorines are really electronegative and they're going to uh, dominate the, the polarity of those of that entire molecule. So there you go. There's that. Let's do two more and then we're we're all done. So this one, this one's pretty easy. You've got a carbon which is four electrons plus an oxygen is six. Two hydrogens is two more. Add that together real quick. That's twelve. You got to put the carbon somewhere, probably the middle, right? Because it's the one that's going to fit there. Um, if you think about which one is which, the oxygen is more electronegative, so we're probably going to put that on the outside. Uh, let's go ahead and give the oxygen an octet. And there we go there. And you realize, okay, well, unfortunately, carbon does not have uh, the octet. So now is the case where we'll take two of these um, non-bonding electrons and we'll form a double bond. So now we see that oxygen has an octet, carbon has an octet, and each of the hydrogens has two electrons, and that's very happy. If you think about it, that's going to be essentially the same uh, 3D structure because this is going to be planar. So this is trigonal planar. And if you think about it, all of these bonds, the angles are going to be 120 degrees, ideally. But since you've got a double bond here, I would say that these are going to be larger than maybe, you know, this would be maybe open up a little bit to you know, above 120, whereas this one's going to be a little bit smaller, so it's going to be less than 120 because there's more repulsion from that double bond than a single bond, and it's going to push those out. So there you go. And if you think about polarity in this case, this is a polar bond where the oxygen is going to uh, dominate because um, it's more electronegative, and so the dipole is in that direction. Our last one's really kind of a neat one, xenon uh, tetrafluoride. 
uh, xenon being a noble gas. Not too many compounds form with xenon, but um, you get a few. So fluorine's really reactive, so it'll react with that. So we get eight plus uh, four times seven is 28. You add those together, and that's a lot. You get 36 electrons for this one. So we'll throw the, the xenon here, and we'll just go ahead and put uh, the four fluorines around it. And then we'll go ahead and give them all an octet. Okay, there we go, there we go. Almost done, going around the horn here. And then you notice we, we've only gone to 32, so um, we'll have to put the extra two non-bonding pair on the xenon. And you might ask, well, why do you do that? Why are you breaking the octet rule? Well, uh, in this case, xenon is a pretty big atom. It can, it can accommodate more electrons, so no big deal there. And so if you see here, you got one, two non-bonding lone pairs, and then one, two, three, four. So this is sort of based on the octahedron, right? But if you have two lone pairs, that means it can find the, all four of those fluorines to the plane. So this would be a square planar geometry. And we don't even have to draw it again because we've already drawn it in that uh, orientation. Um, if you want to look at the bond angles, um, I would say all of the uh, fluorines are going to be roughly uh, 90 degrees apart, which is pretty much what you would assume for a square. And since the lone pair is equaled out by the other lone pair, it's going to be roughly ideal because they're being pushed um, by opposing forces, so they will stay there in the middle. We've got one lone pair behind the paper, one lone pair in front of the paper, and the fluorines in the paper. So that's that's pretty pretty stable. And then. Um, if you think about the dipole, sure the xenon fluorine bond is, is polar, but they all cancel each other out, and so there's no net dipole. Um, so this would be a good example where you have a nonpolar molecule, but there are four different bonds that are very polar, but they cancel each other out. And so you can go back to the reading if you have questions on that. But um, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, I hope this has helped a little bit. Um, we'll do some more problems in class on Monday and get you ready for that exam. So thank you very much. Have a good one.